thank you all very much for having me here. Um, it's, it's great to be connected in this way, particularly at this time for me where I'm finding life a little bit um, lonesome, although it's getting quite busy. It's great to be back in touch with so many incredible people and people that I want to start by saying thank you to um, because this network of, of folk have made a significant difference to me both personally and professionally um, and particularly people that come to mind that I can't not mention Terry Ingham, Judith Hemming, Frank McNeil, Jane James, Fanula and my sister Steph Gray Blessed who introduced me very much to systemic approaches and systemic thinking and what I'm going to talk through in the next sort of half an hour or so is how I've applied um, that, that thinking practically through my experience in education as a, a head teacher. I've been a head teacher for about 18 years and the majority of my time has been um, in, an, in headships of schools supporting children who have experienced significant adversity and therefore have social, emotional and mental health difficulties. Most of these children have been excluded on a number of occasions from a variety of schools and have come into the schools to, 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 so that we can work with them and their families to enable a more positive pathway through life for them. And in all of the, the settings that I've worked, I drew from my learning through the systemic practice. Um, I'm currently an independent advisor. I do a lot of work in schools um, and I'm also a member of the Youth Justice Board. My strategic lead there is education and safety in children's prisons, in custody, and also I'm taking a lead in developing and transforming what is our current um, custodial service, which we feel isn't necessarily fit for purpose for our youngsters into developing secure schools. So it's a very exciting time. And uh, I've learned hugely from the children with whom I've worked as I have the, the, the staff teams that I've worked with. A key part of, um, of what I'm going to really sort of sum up in, in my, my talk today really is about how we can go through from this pandemic to reconnect schools and move in towards a, a recovery model and use the experiences in as positive way as possible to develop resilience in the future. So that's me, that set my scene and I'm sat in Norfolk in the UK with two dogs that I'm hoping will be well behaved and will be quiet. So fingers crossed with that one. And Raymond, thank you. If you could move on to the next slide, please. So what I'm going to be kind of looking at is how at the moment we know that people are going through all sorts of um, emotional experiences and whilst we can presume for many there will be difficulties, there'll be glimmers of such hope and optimism, um, we know that we're going through significant change and that in itself can be quite quite tricky and the job of school leaders I think has been incredibly incredibly challenging facilitating as much connection as possible so while we are physically distancing we are endeavoring to do all we can to remain socially connected and through this as I've said previously see the, the the glimmers of absolute light and hope and optimism that have come through this experience and use that to co-create throughout our in, entire communities what could be for us all a new normal so thank you Raymond if you can move through with that in mind we're talking about human beings absolutely and you know the, the relationship, the connection of our communities that is somewhat fragmented because we've had to go into um, isolation and self-isolation is quite significant. So how we draw it back together in itself will be quite significant. And for me, the most important perspective that we look at here is that of the, the human perspective. And, and we, we look with such sort of empathy and stress that the the wholeness and the goodness of humankind. And I think that's something for me that's come out so strongly of this experience, how, how folk have re really come together to support each other with such love, with such care, with such reflection and thought. And of course, alongside that, the job of bringing our schools back together, we know that our schools are so much more than just the academic curriculum. So maintaining that at the absolute heart of all we do for us, for me, is really important. And of course, to look at, look at the educational perspective alongside this, knowing that many of our children may well have missed out on some of their academic learning. 
but actually many of our children equally have had the most incredible opportunities to connect in different ways with different activities which are equally if not even more wholesome and supportive for future success and again we'll touch upon that so my mission really this afternoon is to whiz through some of the things that um, we've been working on at the moment I'm working with two multi-academy trusts each one has about 14 schools about our way of moving towards reconnection so thank you Raymond if you could move on to the next slide and of course um, I'm very much aware that we will all be living through our own personal experience but just to take a moment to sort of acknowledge that that will be different for each one of us and how we can how we may well presume some of the issues that we will be facing as potentially we reconnect with our whole schools it's just checking out how well and how accurate do we really know the issues in our communities and how have we really checked that out i know my lived experience i'm very much aware of that but it's probably very very different from many other people's lived experiences i live in norfolk in a beautiful countryside a different experience for me so for me checking out the actuality of the lived experiences of all of those in our communities will be really fundamental and that's a challenge because that's sitting in a very a vulnerable situation of currently acknowledging that we don't know and therefore to be courageous in that knowing and to sensitively reach out to form those kind of connections that will enable all of our stakeholders within our communities to really share their lived experience we are all such icebergs in the ocean and we show that tiny bit of ourselves and that's how we want other people to perceive us actually there's so much more that we sometimes choose not to share and i think there's a potential for that to be happening for many of our families many of our children our communities as people are facing different circumstances and certainly some circumstances they may not have faced before for example financial difficulty we may well have many of our families who have always been pretty steady and managed but now are facing uncertainty potential financial difficulty and that might have in itself an attached stigma if we're not careful so how we move through to get into the lived experience for me in such a time of difficulty is fundamental thank you Raymond if you could move on thank you and and thank you to Fanula for sharing this slide with me because I think it sums up incredibly well the importance that we start with ourselves and our own self-care and our own ability to sit quietly and reflect and not rush into decision making but really from a place of absolute self-awareness as much as possible so we then perform and we act from a sense of self-awareness as opposed to a sense of self-defense and so by being that that self-aware reflective individual that's prepared to show up in the conversation as vulnerable as that may feel we will then be able to connect with others and support and really hear in to those lived experiences and be able to manage how that impacts on us and therefore how we connect and start to work in very small groups by working on myself and actually how am i in this situation we can start to connect with our our teams and certainly some of the activities that we'll be talking through later is how schools may well think about going about that so for me at the heart of this is how we manage ourselves and how we are being which will impact significantly across the entire system across our entire community thank you Raymond and with that if you could do the next slide please Raymond that would be great thank you and the, the journey and being prepared that the, the, the journey is one of you know significant challenges but significant hope and optimism so how we share and draw connectedness across the community so that we know that we're in this together social isolation loneliness is potentially so incredibly um, uh, um, impactful in terms of anxiety and fear and standing alongside each other is going to be really really key for that so the role of the teachers and what is it that our teachers need to be steady and sufficiently calm to be alongside and prepared for our children and our families coming back to be whole again and so we we now, now know although us as 
educators, people in this, in this sphere, we've always known that our schools are so much more than academic factories. We've known it's about the human perspective and the real wholesome care and love we give to our children, families and communities. So really thinking about that as we connect back together will be crucial. And thank you, Raymond. I reiterate to go back to retaining the connection and you know experiencing today yesterday and the, and the first day of this global conference you know that sense of togetherness connectiveness will will be what will enable our leaders our schools to go back together because they're not alone they're not isolated with their supporting and along alongside and i think we, we need to be really really clear about that thank you raymond Knowing, I think as well, and there's a lot of talk about this, going back to normal. Yes, we are seeking for routine, for structure, for some of our, our previous routines, absolutely key, key but we have, we have learned so much in terms of our environmental change and, and how we can really draw upon this and to link this and thread this through into what will be a new normal for, for some of our schools. So identifying out of this, yes, there's significant bereavement, loss, change, tragedy. There's also a hope and a burning flame that we can really ignite into something really quite optimistic. And keeping a hold of that through this time of reconnection for me is very very important. Thank you, Raymond, because as we go through what we have here, as we co-create, come back together, is a real opportunity not to go back to the same old. Now that in itself will be a challenge because they're habitualized behaviors for many ground upon years and years of repetitive approaches. So standing strong together to be candidly kind, to support and really shine the light on how we can start to think about things in a slightly different way. Thinking needs a safe place for reflection, for thought, a psychologically safe environment if we're really to reflect upon our learning and take it into our what will be our new future. Thank you, Raymond. And we know through the ACEs Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the significant impact of trauma and ad adversity, physiologically, biologically, we know the science behind this, but we also know in Bruce Perry's words, relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. So we know our children, our families, our communities will have experienced adversity. We also know that if we put the right relational support alongside that, then in actual fact, the resilience that can be facilitated will be quite significant. And I love this, this Japanese art form called Kintosukuri. When a, a ceramic is, is fractured or broken, it's, it's put together, back together with molten gold or molten silver. And so therefore it becomes so much stronger as a result of the experience. And we know some incredible people, Nelson Mandela, for example, and the adversity that they faced with the right relational support it can transform into something incredibly positive and that's what I think we're endeavouring or going to endeavour to do here certainly with the schools that are connected through some of the work that we're doing. Um, thank you very much Raymond and to again see, see the positives but also acknowledge that there is significant bereavement, significant loss and we need to work through that and the only way that we can really work through this is to create those spaces of psychologically, psychologically safe spaces so people can show up and share their story, share their experience and so therefore we will have a more an evidence-based understanding of the actuality of what's happening within our communities and so we can then plan in an informed way to respond to some of those issues. So thank you Raymond. If we go through some of the things that we're, we're looking at and identifying. So for an example, um, one of the mats in Derbyshire that I, I'm working with, and they have schools in the middle of Derby City in um, high levels of significant deprivation, and in Derbyshire, where small village schools, and really trying through a database being collated by a number of highly creative practitioners to get the, the lived reality of both the staff, 
the parents and the children in all sorts of ways. So some will be through a questionnaire, but also we need to make it through accessible text for those youngsters that can't communicate through um, questionnaires, for example. And so we have visual aids to try and get that sort of the authentic truth from each of those stakeholders. And as that's coming through, we're using that and it's the analysis of that so that we can start to be informed as to how we can move forward. Many of our staff are very concerned about coming back into schools themselves and what's going to be happening. And whilst we'll be taking the advice from the, from the government and the Department for Education, what we're really pressing upon is if each of our schools and our settings has a real clear evidence-based um, informed approach knowing the reality for that environment then we do our own risk reduction and risk assessment and so while the advice might be from the government that we take in a specific year group if our own evidence informed risk assessment says that that's not right for us we stand connected together to support each other to do the right thing for our children and we've got the tangible evidence as much as possible as to why thank you raymond if we can move to the next one thank you now we also know that we have quite a number of our families that are vulnerable and previous to lockdown they were on a list of vulnerable children accessing free school meals now the children who come back to us may not be the same children who were on that vulnerable list as it were we need to decipher what do we mean by vulnerability there's vulnerability in relation to need and there will be vulnerability in relation to risk and those children who maybe um, were able that weren't accessing free school meals at that time might now be able to access that because of issues within their family such as such as finance the reality is all of our children all of our staff and all of our, our communities are vulnerable so getting in to have that conversation will be key and i'm not a head teacher right now but if i were i would be starting by saying as your head teacher i am vulnerable without your support so please give me your support by sharing in confidence with great sensitivity your authentic truth and enable me to do what i can across with the community from the community to respond to that otherwise we all remain vulnerable so coming together, I think it will be absolutely imperative. Thank you, Raymond. We can have the next one. So in terms of staff, um, the, uh, the couple of the, the mats that we're talking about at the moment have kind of created a journey of, of what they are currently working on and what they're endeavouring to achieve in the short and the long term and sort of started to look at different themes. So for example, how we stay connected, um, the authentic truth of our communities, what support is needed for our staff teams and many of the, the schools that we're working with actually want some support about their own self-regulation, self-awareness. Um, um, there's a, a lot of staff that are really absolutely running to do the best that they possibly can and so running with a level of anxiety and potential fear and we know when we're in that space our ability to think, reflect, to organise is reduced significantly. So allowing everybody to take a breath to stop and reflect together absolutely key planning for a return what that might look like the reconnection and how we start to stagger and phase children and staff to come back the type of curriculum that's going to be in place and of course what that will look like in the long term and some excellent some fantastic work that they've been doing that i'll share with you in a moment so thank you raymond we can just keep on going Thank you. So the sustainable approach, knowing our families, I've mentioned that if we can keep on going, sorry, Raymond, I didn't want to keep saying keep on going. I'm just sort of flicking through these wanting to get really to the nitty gritty of some of the, 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 the ideas that some of our schools are sharing. So if we move on to the next slide, and ideally, so being clear of the provision, absolutely being clear of the needs so that we can inform the provision and how we're going to do this. So, a couple of the schools from Lincolnshire, another one of them, Matt, if you can carry on please, Raymond, really thinking about how it might look like. If we can go back please, Raymond, sorry. Thank you. So, the, the social and emotional recovery here, so if we go forward, sorry. 
to the first set of pictures, if you don't mind. That. So, for example, um, some of the whilst we're, we're we're gathering the authentic truth of the community, we have groups of staff that are setting up what it might look like for staff to, to return. And one of the activities on the first day of staff return is a communal breakfast. People coming in with food to sit and just talk and share their stories, as it were, and have opportunities to hear each other and truly listen. So part of that is some training around how do we actively listen and give everybody the opportunity to share their voice? How can we really give permission for staff to share their concerns, their own experiences of bereavement and loss? And then they're looking at almost three days with staff teams before children come back into the school at all to do some specific training about bereavement, about loss, um, self-regulation, co-regulation, identifying that many of the behaviours that may well be exhibited by our children and families maybe communicating unmet needs, behaviour, um, fear, anxiety and so being the detectives to look behind those behaviours are going to be is going to be very very important and how does that sit within our behaviour policies so being really clear about how we need our staff to be both for each other but also for our children. And um, we talk about Dan Hughes being in pace or place, being that sort of placeful, loving, accepting, curious with empathy, you know, being the steady regulated adult in preparation for those children. And that will take some preparation to support our adults to be regulated and steady because they too will have had to work through their own issues. And so, then we've started to think about some of the activities that the adults could do to, to almost experience the activities that they will do with the children. And some of the, another team of um, our staff at the moment are developing almost that reconnection to recovery curriculum for children. So if you go on to the next stage, please, Raymond, the next slide. Many of those staff are creating things like the mood thermometers with a view to children coming back in to work alongside that. A lot of the activities such as, um, you'll have seen the, the picture on the previous slide, that the web of connection about sharing some of our, our experiences, what happened to enable colleagues to be able to share and children to share their, their experience and find out that actually there are some key similarities around that. And then as, as children start to come back in, they will, have, they will start to do some of the activities that the adults would have done. So for example, the expectation will have been, uh, as a result of our own in-school risk assessments, we will stagger groups of children as and when we feel most appropriate in terms of vulnerability, vulnerability of need, vulnerability of risk. And the activities that we will do with those children are activities such as the web of connection, that kind of communal coming together for breakfast and conversation. So real low stakes, low challenge active, just reconnecting with each other. And one of the activities that staff will have done, which is something I know very much from systemic practice, is the jigsaw. And sort of representing using arts and crafts on one side of one of the jigsaw pieces the more the, the, the kind of what 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 was lost during that period what was missed during that period and then sharing that flipping that over and representing on the other side what was the positive how how did we get through what was the 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 strength within myself and that around me that enabled um, for us to survive through this pandemic and then starting as children to come back into school placing those jigsaw pieces together to almost metaphorically um, signify the group coming back together and co-creating something quite magnificent something quite powerful will be really important but I think what's quite clever about some of the, the schools that we're working with at the moment is they've been setting sort of home activities which is all about co or collating a scrapbook of their journal of experience through this period because they're living through history their their children and their children's children will be learning about this when they're in school themselves so our children and our staff have been creating scrapbooks from their first experiences so it might be bits from newspapers bits from the newspaper in the uk our prime minister has written to all households so there's copies of that in examples of activities and the teachers are doing the same so when the children start to come back in 
they are going to work towards developing near Christmas time, um, if, if we're able to do that, a museum of hope and optimism, reflecting the entire journey, which means that the children will be sort of project based, sharing and finding a way to narrate their experience. And that will become more independent as those children come back into school, meaning that the capacity of the staff is very much available to meet and support the children who will be coming through in the next phase, as it were. So there's a real continuum of activity and um, they've developed a whole range of resources and support, um, a whole repertoire themed in a library so that we can work with one-to-one -one children if need be, small groups and, and, and grow into uh, to larger class sizes, responding to individual needs and group needs. For example, if there has been bereavement or loss then there's a whole range of activities that can that, that the teachers don't then need to be sort of rushing around to develop those kind of resources and the feedback has been that that is is, is really very very um, helpful and really quite supportive so and then what what you see on this slide is um, something that we've we've tended to do with schools and we're, we're we've planned to do with the classes as they come back together just as they're they're rejoining at a, a place where all of the the children within a group will be pe uh, present which is uh, a path and that's planning alternative tomorrows with hope where we really look at identifying the, 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 the bits of this journey that have been really, really positive and represent that visually in our sort of North Star dream of what our new normal will look like. And then sort of reflect back into some of the experiences and what it's like coming back into a school in this situation and then thinking about how we work together, how we stay strong and how we take small steps as individuals within this, this, this bigger system to come together to co-create, you know, the, the, the real big picture strategic overview, as it were. And that, that's what you can see an example of that there. So if we can move on, please, Raymond, because I know that I've been speaking for almost half an hour and a real core part of what we wanted to do today was to, to reflect and respond to any questions um, where folk will be doing some incredible work all around the world an opportunity to share that in terms of supporting our children our families our communities to reconnect with with the, the school as the heart of that community coming back together and so through this thread of the journey working it, in a, in a systemic way as possible, thinking about the social emotional of well-being of everybody involved in this and that this being the absolute key to really opening up opportunity, thinking about our staff and how we're going to prepare our staff, staff who potentially will be anxious to come back, staff who potentially will be in financial difficulty themselves, staff who potentially will be experiencing significant bereavement and loss and how we can really resource those colleagues up in the best way possible and to really share authentically that it's okay not to be okay. Um, and we need folk to be self-aware sufficiently and to be kind, candidly so, to support alongside and identify when actually where we may well think we're okay, we need perhaps a little bit of support and that's okay to take on board that extra help. What might the curriculum look like for those children coming in in phases, in stages? How can we support our middle leaders, senior leaders, and our head teachers who are carrying such a weight of responsibility and accountability here? How can we really support and work alongside to keep them, keep them as strong as possible? And underpinning this is that sort of real making sure we are working towards what the problem, finding out what the real issues are, what the real problems are, so that we're responding in an informed way and not just in that sort of assumption-based presumption mechanism. Thank you, Raymond. If we pop through this one and the next one, please. You can move on, please, Raymond, if you don't mind. Thank you. And I think to reiterate, it's almost, we, there is significant pressure coming from our Department of Education in the UK, 
and from the government to reconnect us, connect our schools as quickly as possible. We're hearing that we'll reconnect year sixes first and then year tens and then elevens. I think the thing is we stand together and we take a breath and we support each other to take, take that breath so we can really breathe in, sit with the vulnerability of not knowing, but do all we can to find out and seek the actuality of the issues that would be very, very different potentially from our own and then respond accordingly. And that's certainly some of the work that we're doing at the moment. And what I'd like now, if possible, Raymond, is for you to stop screen sharing, thank you, so that we can then open up the chat facility for where there may well be um, some comments, some, some supportive strategies that folk that are doing out there. Also, um, any questions that, that you may well have that I, I can try to respond to. And if not, we have so many experts in this space that can certainly um, support alongside. Um, now I'm just looking through the chat and there's some, how do school leaders gather data? I think that's a question from, from Linda. And the way in which certainly some of our schools are working on this is that already they've set up um, situations such as this, where they're having Zoom meetings. Now, some of our, it, and they're, they're recording all of the families that they are in touch with. But equally, they're recording all of the families that they're not able to reach out to. Um, most of our schools, instead of giving what was in the UK, the free school meal vouchers that you can just send through the post or send online, the schools are using that and purchasing food stock so that, you know, they can go and visit and either drop off the food stocks for our families or the families will pop in. And in terms of social distancing, it meant maintaining that, but really checking out that they have, they, they've seen their children, they've seen their families and that they're very much available. Other, other schools are doing survey monkeys and they're doing anonymous survey monkeys. Others are really reaching out via telephone and having a conversation and we know whilst we're not in physical proximity but in terms of prosody of voice, pitch tone, we can connect and reach out to support and develop that psychologically safe environment through just being, being aware of how we're coming across. And it actually, for most of these schools now, it's looking like a significant database that is really, because of GDPR and data protection, it, it's very, very secure. And it includes where families, staff members ex have experienced loss, bereavement, death of the family. So again, we can be aware of this type of thing and anticipate the potential needs that will need to be met, be ready for it, prepared for, and build capacity. And that's certainly in my experience how the schools we're working with are gathering that data, for want of a better word. Um, the... Um, another question, Linda, I hope that responds. If not, um, ask another question with that. In terms of the, the, the jigsaw, and I think, I think that's a message from Ali, and this is a, a systemic tool um, that, that basically it's a very simple, beautiful tool where it might be that the staff team, first of all, have a piece of jigsaw, and on this side, I may represent using lots of craft materials, whatever it might be, or painting or pictures or words, however artistic or not, um, maybe some of the, the aspects of this situation that's meant I've missed, I've missed my family, I've missed my friends, I've missed face-to-face -face training, I've missed all of those kind of things. So I would represent that on here. And then maybe share, using the metaphor or being as, as um, um, explicit as I wish, as safe as I feel, I could share that with my group. Yeah. And then on the other side, I could represent some of the, you know, the, the, the incredibly positives for me, the impact on the environment, for example. Actually, I, I've had connection, albeit online, with some people that I'd lost connection with. We sit with this group of people, you know, people that I haven't seen for a very long time. And then what we can do is, if, if, or if the staff do something like this first, we can then start to piece this together. And certainly, again, the schools that we're working with um, in Derby and Lincoln, what they're endeavouring to, to create is a whole school jigsaw, sort of really showing coming back together, which in itself will be something quite visually um, powerful, I believe. So, Ali, I hope that answers your 
I'll say uh, your question about the the jigsaw, um, and so. Um, the spider's web from Fanula, and there was a, a very much a picture um, about that. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, then shout and Raymond can unmute you. I want to ask a question, but I was waiting for you to finish. <laughs> no, 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 no. You first. Ladies first. <laughs> no, go ahead. Who, who's that? I can okay. Hear I think you can see my name. I am in Hassan. I am speaking from uh, Indiana. Ah, yes. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, I hope everyone is safe first. Uh, concerning, concerning the issue you are discussing, it's really informative. The presentation was informative. But uh, let, let us just have a look at uh, uh, are all the schools all over the world ready for facing the situation of pandemic? If you are if you are speaking about supporting the students, especially uh, the students are, let's say, the mean, the mean of the teaching and learning operation inside school or outside schools. Some parents, for example, uh, as you said, some students are suffering from their uh, mentally ill parents, uh, and this is the case I can say in the U.S., especially uh, regarding to some kind of uh, conferences that I attended just lately. They were speaking about students who are facing uh, violence, okay, from their parents due to being with them the whole day inside the house, uh, being or misbehaving, doing different things at home. Uh, now they, they value the, let's say, they understand the value of the teachers, the value of the school. Even even they are now, uh, let's say, resorting to uh, distance learning, but I can say it cannot 100% replace face-to-face -face classrooms. Absolutely. So, so what, what was your question? Sorry, the I think question, I... the question now is, in the in the UK, are let's say our parents. Uh, ready to let's say to deal with their uh, children as students at home so as not to put them in in what can i say in a trouble or psychologically uh, speaking yeah and 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 i don't i don't know the answer to that and i think this is this is what is potentially so um fragile and vulnerable in that we we will do the best that we can and we we will endeavor and hope and believe that in this circumstance our parents will do the best that they can and if there's a way that we can reach out to seek and support and with that as an educationalist i have a, a safeguarding hat on that if i do have a concern then i have to I have to take that to systems within the UK about safeguarding. Absolutely. But, and I think what's so important, because I absolutely hear what you're saying, is trying to, to find out with great sensitivity and real respect, trying to seek out where there may well be difficulties and do what we can to support. And we'll only do that if we can create the psychologically safe environment for some of our parents to say, I'm not okay. okay. I need help. Because always you know we, we are very much aware in uh, in the uk uh, domestic violence has increased the sale of alcohol has increased you know that there will be lots and lots of things that, that are going on and you know it's a, a it's a real real worry and we will do the best we can yeah, okay. thank you very much for your answer i hope that that responds yeah okay thank you any other any other questions any other thoughts about that um, Jane James um, ha has has brought up you know that that the use of the the art and creativity and um, I'm a, um, a Thrive trainer as is one of my very good friends on here Alistair um, Alistair Martin Somerset England and certainly you know the creative arts as a, a vehicle to support both children and adults to share through the metaphor through a sort of an arm's distance of safety their lived experience is a, a, super, a superb way forward um, and it by our very our very human instinct we want we need to kind of 
tidy things up. We want to create a story, as it were. And what we, we need to be careful is that we don't confabulate a story, that, and actually that, we're, that we're able to share our own experiences a way, in a way in which is accessible for us, whether we're five years old, 10 years old, 50 years old, you know, finding that for individuals and the creative arts and also physicality, you know, physical activity is a, another real route in to support with this. Um, Jane, Jane has also mentioned a, a, a closure event in the new year and I think we look at beginnings and we look at endings and the importance of beginnings and endings. Now, um, <laughs> If I, if I were a head of a school, and certainly my, my advice, my thinking here is it's an absolute necessity to, when we're looking at end of key stages where children move from one school to another or leave school altogether, that we do something to, to, to bring those youngsters back in, in whatever way is appropriate, at a time that is appropriate. And we have some kind of, um, sort of the, the ceremonies that we tend to have in our UK schools. Um, it's, it's interesting with the, the talk about, for example, our primary schools in the UK finish at year six. They then move on to the secondary school. And something that our, our Department for Education is considering is should our year sixes come back into our primary schools to finish off the summer term? And it, it's an interesting one because our year sixes will return to a primary school that will not be the same primary school that they left they will be coming into an environment whilst it will be physically the same quite confusing because emotionally and the sense of that environment will be one that's completely different so we need to think about this in terms of the emotional journey of those children so where logically it might make sense for those year sixes to go back to say goodbye to their teachers to their school my experiences of those goodbyes are hugs and laughter and activity and graduation and writing on each other's t-shirts, messages, but that won't be able to happen. And that will potentially be the expectation of those year six children. So let's pause, let's breathe, and let's think actually, is there a more creative way, more supportive way that actually some of those year sixes in this period before ideally, if we do go back to schools in September, visit with some of their teachers, their new place that they will be going to, as opposed to coming back to a place that is no longer the place that they really, really feel and understand and sense it's different, and then have to get used to that before then going through a transition to another place. And so what I'm really calling for is the courage to sit for a moment without the answers and really think through having that space for reflection and breathe, breathe deeply, because we can very quickly head off. We're quick workers in schools. We're used to crisis and managing and sorting out. This is complex and it's complicated. And those two very different sort of areas, we need to think very carefully and keep our leaders strong to be able to sit in a space with that. Um, Alistair, we need to remember the importance of our art-based activities, supporting emotional well-being, expression, such a, a great vehicle, absolutely Alistair, and also mindfulness. Um, again, and we're talking about that, when we're taking this space to breathe and be truly in touch with ourselves, so that we're truly connected with ourselves, connected with that around us, so that we can authentically then go in to connect with others and be emotionally available. And I think that's gonna be absolutely key. But for that, I need to be emotionally available to myself and therefore put myself first. And the, the guilt and potential, as people on here know me well, you know, sometimes we find that difficult, but that, that um, I apologize for the cliche, our own oxygen masks is gonna be really key here too. Um, um, Jane, Alistair, we can't see what you're saying, but we'd li like to. You will want to hear Alistair. Alistair um, is, is also reiterating the importance of the arts, emotional well-being, the importance of mindfulness. And um, it, it's something 
the trusts that we're looking at at the moment are supporting quite a few of their staff to really research into and explore experientially mindfulness so that then they can when the children start to come back in and colleagues start to come in actually take projects of mindfulness across their class groups and across their school so getting folk to sit still for a little while and that that's okay um, Oh, sorry, Alison. Sorry, sorry, mixing up my names there. Thank you, Alison, for that. Um, any any other questions? Any other thoughts? And thank you, Fanula, for your kind words. And Linda, transition issues. I think I think we've touched upon. Um, it, it's very complex, complicated, because also the transition issues that we may well face. My, um, my sister's daughter, and I'm not sure if my sister is, is, is in here, um, she, she is more than happy for me to share, has a diagnosis of autism, and Elsie has never felt so settled, so happy as being at home. Actually, she has meltdowns when um, Boris Johnson comes on the television and talks about reconnecting schools and coming back into school. So that equally is the transition from previous routines and structures and actually transitioning not just within those significant year groups but actually our children with additional needs not necessarily vulnerable because at risk but vulnerable because of their additional needs to then moving back into a school and being really clear that the overwhelm of going from being at home within sort of that real sort of nuclear setting into large secondary schools would just not be appropriate so taking our time with that. When we're talking about the ways that teachers can deal with students um, around grief and loss in the, in the classroom, what, what we find um, a real sort of, uh, uh, that the therapeutic story is something that, that can be really quite useful. Again, use it, the use of the metaphor. There's a whole array of, of resources out there and certainly Margot Sunderland's therapeutic stories I use all the time but also writing our own therapeutic stories with our children for our children alongside our children can be really helpful so again it's using the metaphor and characters who are in similar types of situations and there are so many beautiful resources that have been written that are on um, the internet um, around the pandemic and the use of therapeutic stories so those resources are already available um, that one of one school specifically very sadly um, one of their teachers has passed away during this period um, not due to COVID-19 um, a, a member of staff who who the school was her very life she'd been in the school for 35 years as a member of staff and when she came to isolation and lockdown she became very poorly and has now has now died so the school is already preparing as to how we, they can support the staff um, in terms of that significant loss and bereavement and that sort of the creative ideas about having sort of a, a ritual um, coming together and um, creating sort of a, a memory jars for her for that member of for that that member of staff that's no longer within the school and and thinking about writing postcards, things they, that they might have wanted to say to her that they can't say, and saying those and blowing bubbles, and that, that type of activity. So a whole range of amazing sort of, again, through the creative arts, ways of, of saying goodbye and passing on postcards, letters that we may well want to write, making little treasure boxes. And one of the most beautiful activities that is a, a I learned through my experience with Thrive, is getting little jars and some salt and chalk and a little pile of salt and thinking about the person in mind and thinking about what 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 comes to mind so for example my, my grandma what comes to mind for me is the love she had so my little pile of salt I would color in with red chalk and to represent her love and pour that into a little glass bottle and then I would absolutely have to pour in a little bit of golden glitter because she sparkled my goodness did she absolutely sparkle and layer upon layer representing different aspects of my beautiful grandma and having a beautiful little glass jar with all of the layers that represent her as my transitional object and a way of sharing with others showing not necessarily having the words but just the sense 
sense of what I miss, what I love, what I admired about my grad those types of activities that, that can mean the world. Um, Emir is talking about a beautiful memory book um, that where his, his children, where their, their grandfather um, died a long time ago, and it really brought him back to us in the months and years after his death, and again in the last few days when we found it. So a beautiful idea, a memory book. Um, puppet stories, Linda is saying, and, and students then sort of share and illustrate their own journeys. Um, talking about teachers and students in grief, um, looking at how we can best support parents who feel overwhelmed during this unsettling time. I think as much as possible reaching out and having having telephone conversations and creating a space where if the parents are reaching out for that help i think that's fabulous absolutely fabulous and the fact they're reaching out in itself will be helpful by just talking to somebody else and alongside that being really aware of the families that aren't reaching out that haven't contacted the school and that haven't requested and help and just coming forward and, and offering so that we can be there for them um, and I think really explaining as a, as a, as a teacher, I'm, I'm not a parent, but I have lots of children that I love and I, <laughs> I act uh, hopefully in a, in a way that is um, uh, with, with deep care, is that it, it's difficult for all of us. And I think there's, there's potential pressure that we, we have to be perfect through this. And we won't be perfect and we mustn't be perfect. You know, we must to, to, we must go extravagantly in making our mistakes and learning from them and acknowledging them with and from our children that it's okay to make those mistakes. And sometimes we may well get cross and we're not thinking about what we're saying and talking that through with our youngsters is really helpful for them too. And apologizing because where there's rupture <laughs> in a relationship, there's a real opportunity for repair and where there's rupture there's repair what is facilitated is that resilience and to get through any adversity in life we need that resilience we're not born with that resilience we learn that resilience from relationships that rupture and the relationships with folk that are open enough courageous enough to get right in there and say i am sorry i am sorry and I am right by your side and let's repair this. And for me, as I'm coming to an end, I think it's about our schools potentially have been ruptured, that the connections have been ruptured and our job through the relationship and it's only through the relationship. Yes, there's a role for CAMS workers, yes, specialists, but the, the people, the relationship is the best form of therapy. And so we come back with that relationship to repair that rupture with the people such as you guys in our schools, in our settings that are the molten silver, that are the molten gold that will together all of us co-create what will be our new normal, our new ceramic that will be with hope and optimism so much stronger. So it's half past. Thank you very much. If there are 